So without further ado, I will get started. So today I'm going to be talking about my experience with the Caravan Stage Company, um, sort of affectionately known as a group of theater pirates. And as Diane mentioned, uh, we were able to connect because of a podcast I produced about this story for CBC's The Doc Project. It's a three episode mini series and we don't have too much time today. So I'm really going to try and condense the story, but I encourage you to check out um, CBC's The Doc Project. This show is called Caravan and it's three episodes that aired in October. So you can find those episodes online. We also have a, a sort of a, a company in microsite uh, through CBC Interactives. And you can see lots more pictures. Um, there's some sort of animated schematics and things. So if you're interested in the story and have more questions, please feel free to jump in. So what is the Caravan Stage Company? Uh, they are many things. They are a theater company. They are sort of an arts collective. They are a ship. Um, they are a couple. Uh, it's one of the most difficult questions to answer, I think. So hopefully by the end, if I do my job properly, you'll have a much better idea. So you've already met me. Here I am again. Uh, thank you, Diane, for the warm welcome. So let's jump into this story. So this is the ship, uh, which is probably a primary interest to all of you as shellbacks. So this ship is called the Amara Z. It is the workspace and home and theater of the Caravan Stage Company. And so I, of course, want to tell you much more about the ship and show you around the ship. But in order to do that, to really appreciate why this is such an interesting story, I think we have to jump back to the very beginning. So here's the ship here. This is when I was with the ship. But we have to get to know this couple first to understand the story. So this is Paul Kirby on your left and his partner, Adriana Kelder on your right. They are the founders uh, and helms people of the Amara Z. They're in their seventies now. So I've always known them looking like this. I first worked with them in 2012, but sort of where our story begins, uh, they looked a bit more like this. So sort of fantastic costumes, um, this is an old picture from when they lived in horses and wagons, which is almost where the story starts. So if we jump back to Montreal in the 1960s, this is where Paul Kirby and Adriana Kelder met for the first time. So Adriana is from Holland originally, Paul's from out west in Vancouver, and they were both in Montreal in the 60s, which was kind of like a hub of counterculture. Um, Adriana was studying art and Paul was studying philosophy and ended up starting this underground newspaper called Logos. So Logos is an alternative, um, it's an alternative newspaper from Montreal, but also it acted as a sort of communal hub. It was a physical house that people would lived in. Um, there were a lot of demonstrations they did. At one point, a group of them were running a hostel for draft dodgers who were coming up from the States. So it was really sort of an alternative counterculture uh, community there. And they did run this newspaper. So Adriana came on board to do some design for them initially. And they were always provocative with the newspapers they did. Uh, certainly, you know, it was very sort of against the, the powers that be in Montreal at the time. But the big issue that got them in trouble and really set this whole adventure into motion was this issue here, which is from November in 1968. So this is actually the back page of an issue of Logos, but it's made to look like the front page of the Montreal Gazette. And this is satire, of course, but to them, this hilarious satire was saying that the mayor had been shot. Um, and they distributed this newspaper in front of metro stations in Montreal. So not everyone uh, appreciated the levity of this sort of performance art. And they were actually fined. They had charges of obscenity and sedition, which were later dropped. But basically, it became a huge sort of focal point um, in Montreal about the freedom of speech and the importance of the freedom of speech to publish sort of what you want. So a lot of people kind of shot back and said, uh, this nude here is in reference to uh, one of the covers they did where someone appeared with body paint on them in lieu of clothing. Um, and of course, you know, 
swear vulgarity at the time, the idea being artistic expression. Uh, so a lot of people spoke out for them. Eventually the charges were dropped, but it sort of caused enough of a kickback against them that they decided they wanted to head out west. So they ended up going out to British Columbia in 1970. And that's where they started something called Little People's Caravan. And that was sort of um, kind of like a puppet show, but a bit of a presentation that happened from wagons. And I think really also an excuse to be nomads because that's who they were as people. They were creative, they were uh, you know, expressionists. They wanted to live a life sort of of their own devising as opposed to the life that was handed to them. And part of that included where they could live. So there's actually, these stills are taken from a really fantastic national film board documentary called Horse Drawn Magic. It's only about 20 minutes long. It was made in the seventies. And I really encourage you to check it out if this period interests you. So they had this team here. This is in 1970, 11 Clydesdale horses and a crew of about 20 people. And this is the way they lived going around. They traveled about 15 kilometers a day and they went to rural communities who typically didn't have access to theater or circus and they would present these things there. The work was still political at the time, not as political as the newspaper they'd been producing in Montreal, but they certainly they weren't really compromising for anyone. So this continued for about 20 years. I'm really fast forwarding the story for you. Um, so about 20 years, they lived like this. They went all over North America, um, the United States and Canada, which at the time was much easier. Imagine trying to take 11 Clydesdales across the Canada US border today. Um, I'm sure half of them didn't even you know, have identification on them. Um, so anyway, what happened is as things became a little more difficult to travel on land and certainly very tiring, uh, it was a lot of work to keep those horses and to always be in a new place. They decided they, that to sort of fulfill their vision, they had to build a ship and they couldn't just buy a ship. They had to build a ship completely from scratch because they wanted their ship to be a theater, to have a theater on its deck. So of course, you know, a bunch of, uh, radical hippies do not have the money to build a ship like this on their own. But what they did know how to do was style communications from their newspaper. So they were able to get over 400 donors across North America and Europe to donate to this project in total over $3 million. Uh, and this was in the 90s. So I, I can't even imagine what the value of that would be today. But that's one of the big things about Caravan that kind of flow through this entire story is that they never have anything, but they have huge dreams. And so to make it happen, they're constantly just asking people to believe in what they do and donate what they have. I wish I had more picture, pictures to show you of this period, but I have been able to track down a few. So this whole ship you can see in the top left picture, and I'll show you some more pictures of this room later. This is the main space of the ship. And even the architecture inside is quite creative. So we have this big cutout, which would go on to be a bookcase. And then in the front here, you can see two circular pieces of wood. Those are tables, but originally, if you can see, they extend up and there's actually plastic tubes around those tables. The idea with these tubes was that they would sit in the middle of the boat and extend down beneath the ship. It's a little hard to see, but you can see these tubes a bit. That was supposed to be a river water filtration system. So as they pass through different bodies of water, the water would be sucked up into the ship. It would be filtered and purified on board the ship. And they would actually be leaving cleaner water behind them than they originally entered. This did not happen. Uh, those tables ended up just becoming tables. Those tubes are full of blankets and things like that. Because what happens a lot is they have this huge vision. Sometimes it happens. I would say 50 to 60% of the time, it doesn't quite get there and they have to scupper the idea, but they've got all sorts of fancy things like this that there's no real template for. And then you can see down here in the bottom, this was in Kingston, which you can see on the crane. 
And Kingston is where they built the ship. So they sort of lived in dry dock in trailers for about three years while they were getting the ship together. It was an enormous amount of work, um, but a lot of people came together to help them do it. And they got the ship in the water in 1996. And that's when they did the first show. So I'm about to take you kind of through the ship. But something about the ship, which you may or may not have recognized, depending on how much you know about ships, this is sort of modeled after a Thames River spritzel barge. So they, I've heard this sort of referred to as sort of um, uh, like the 18 wheeler of sort of a, an old shipping period in England. These were really uh, everywhere kind of and used as, as shipping vessels. And there's something special about these is that they have a really shallow draft. So they can travel in water as shallow as one meter, which for a 30 meter ship like this is pretty fantastic. And the reason Caravan wanted this for their ship is so they could be traveling, you know, in all sorts of waterways, lakes and canals and rivers and things like that to take their theater anywhere they wanted to go. So you can see the ship here. This is an illustration I pulled together uh, to make it easier than looking at photos. You've got these big lee boards on the side that they can drop down. It's a bit of like a tall ship too. It's quite tall. And then when it's in show mode, because it's a theater too, they basically strap up all of this equipment. We've got this big theater truss here, which the lights hang from. They build things on top uh, so people can stand there to perform as well. Uh, a lot of performance happens on the deck. The shows are quite acrobatic, sort of circus-like in nature. And you have stuff all over here. Uh, because it's outside and they wanna use lighting, the shows can only take place at night. Uh, otherwise, lights would be completely useless. So another thing they do is hang what we call scrims uh, in front and behind the main performance space so you can project video onto these, these surfaces. And they can't afford scrims. So when I was working with them, for example, they would get uh, kind of netting used to keep bugs out of the plants. They would get it donated to them when it was no longer effective on farms and they would repurpose it as basically screens uh, for the ship. So uh, please <laughs> forgive me if anything is mislabeled. I think probably many of you might know the inner workings of a ship a little better than I do, but I've done my best and had this cross-checked. So this is basically uh, a schematic of the ship with a cutaway so you can see inside just a little bit. So everyone lives in the ship. Up in the bow, you have Paul and Nans's room. Adriana's nickname is Nans, so everyone calls her Nans. And they've got their bed in there, but it basically converts into an office space. So it's sort of like the main uh, workspace of the ship. Then just behind it here, you've got the head, uh, which often is not what we use because you know when you're in dock for a long time, it, they wouldn't be able to plug in. It wasn't super functional. Um, a lot of theater equipment will be stored here. And then they had the first stairwell up to the deck in the front. Uh, going back here, this little hallway, there were bunk rooms on either side. So there was about uh, usually three bunks in a room stacked high, so quite small. And you could sleep about 15 people in this area. Then back here is the salon, which is sort of the, the meeting space of the ship, the common room. And this little A, capital A shaped case is the bookcase that I showed you earlier in the construction photograph. Um, this was styled after what they sort of called uh, like a Bedouin's tent sort of thing. It has like big um, rugs hanging from the wall. Uh, it, it's sort of a loungy, pillowy sort of space. Then back up here, you've got the chart house uh, and you head up here to the back of the ship. We've got a transom deck and then everything that happens on the top. So you can see a couple pictures here um, of some of the very shallow and narrow waterways they were able to tra traverse here. There were always sort of communities on the ship, families on the ship, lots of children. Um, the first time I worked for them in 2012, we were in Sicily in Italy and there was an aerialist and a welder who were raising their, I think an eight month old on the ship. So all ages always, sort of a big commune type environment. 
Here's the ship in Holland. Of course, you can tell by the windmill. So it really went everywhere. So after it was built, for the first stretch of time, it just stayed in North America. Of course, it sort of uh, went into the water initially in Kingston, stayed along the Eastern seaboard for the first 10 or so years. And in 2005 is when they tossed this on a charter ship through donation, of course. Yeah, this, this ship cannot cross the Atlantic. They put it on a big BBC chartering ship and took it over to Europe where it was for about 12 years. So in this picture, you can see the fabric hanging from the top, which is the scrim that I talked about earlier that was donated from farms. And that can be used to project video for the performances. So here's a beautiful picture of the common room. This is that big bookcase, sort of shaped like a boat that you saw here. Um, they've got this big table that sinks down. So your feet hang down into the space below here. This is where we have our meals, but this is also the main meeting space. And these plastic tubes you can see in the table, these were going to be the river water filtration system. As you can see, they are just full of linens. So that did not quite happen. And we have these nice banquettes running around the room. So you would have anywhere, typically anywhere from 15 to 30 people in this room for sort of a big production meeting. We'd have a meeting here every morning. You can't see it quite yet, but soon I'll show you just off to my right where the fire extinguisher is, this is the kitchen. So there's a big sort of um, kitchen with a, with a counter that overlooks the room. We have a nice little stove, wood-burning stove in the corner. Um, and these stairways on either side of the bookcase head up to the chart house. And rugs everywhere. So here's the kitchen. One of the jobs on the ship, so we all had different jobs on the ship. There's so many things to do when you're not only running a ship, but running a theater company and running a community. Uh, one person's job was to cook for everyone. So we have this really tiny, poor little stove back here, which was uh, really always sort of on its last breath. Um, there was a little sort of toaster oven situation back here that never worked in my three and a half years on the ship. Uh, and any food that is here is up for grabs. So if you had something special that you did not want devoured, you would hide it in your room, which in my case was always peanut butter. So I always had a little hidden jar of peanut butter somewhere on the ship. Here are the bunks. So this is me on the left. Uh, they are quite tiny and I am about six feet tall. So this was always a bit of a struggle. I slept on the top bunk always, which is nice. It is a bit, maybe the smallest, but it's the coolest. And this ship gets really, really hot. One of my contracts with them was about 20 minutes south of New Orleans in a town called Lafitte. Uh, sort of on the bayou, and it had the worst mosquitoes I've ever encountered in my life. Just outrageous. So you wanted to always be in the coolest possible space. And the top of the ship, as you can see, all sorts of structures would be built on top of the ship to accommodate the different productions. Uh, I'll show you a few more pictures later on. There's so many examples really of what can happen there. Um, so these platforms here, uh, people would climb up. And of course you can see some of the costumes. So this is one of the masks in the hand. All of these props primarily were designed by Nons who as you remember has a background in fine arts. But the interesting thing about the caravan, uh, as, you, as I told you, the ship was built through donation of you know, about 400 donors. They had no money and all of the shows were done for free. The shows were donation based. So if you came to the shore, you could donate some money and watch the show, but you didn't have to. So all of the props and costumes were made pretty much from donations or most of the time garbage. So this was ceramic powder that we had donated. This is in Sicily. This was donated to us from a ceramic shop, sort of some off cut powder they had. But for example, this big spider puppet is made entirely from garbage. So tubes, um, tire rims, PVC pipes, sort of all sorts of stuff like that. And it would just be put together by some creative young artists 
uh, and then used in the show. These are some masks that were used in the production made completely from wiring and then had more of that fabric that I showed you outside of the ship hung over them. This is an enormous bubble that was used to hold people as part of the show. And you can see this arch here beneath it. I think this may become a seahorse or some sort of creature, but this is made from Culligan water bottles. So all of this stuff was made completely for free. Really, really impressive. Not only that they could do it, but having the constraint, knowing that you had no money, um, a lot of the time resulted in much more creative and interesting work and definitely carried over into the way the ship was maintained and imagined. And a fun thing about it is, as I'm sure a lot of you know, when you pull a beautiful ship up to a port, people want to come look at it. So we always had sort of an audience trailing along. We've got some kids here in Sicily as well, just watching rehearsal, just looking at the ship. Sometimes people would come on for tours. Um, a lot of the times what was special, uh, special about the ship is it would go to a very small community that, that was not a tourist spot. For example, we're in a town called Licata in Sicily, a very, very small. We were pretty much the only non-native Sicilians there. And so it really becomes a, an interesting sort of uh, point of international connection for these communities. And so when I was there primarily, um, Diane mentioned that I'd studied theater. So my background is initially in music theater and I worked as one of the vocal arrangers and composers on the ship sort of way back in the day. So this is us singing here. This is me with that cast the first year in Sicily. This is in 2012. Um, and they would go on to be in the show. This is one of the fiddlers. There was a lot of live music. And I worked for them three and a half years, four separate contracts. So I was in Sicily. I was in Salerno, both in Italy. Uh, I was in New York City, which is where this is. This is in Brooklyn. And we were also just south of New Orleans in a town called Lafitte. So this is the, the cast and crew in 2015. All of the people who come and join Paul and Nons on the ship. Again, this is Paul and Nons here in the front. Everyone is volunteering, but everyone is a professional in their field. So you still have to apply to be selected to come on this. But we have um, puppet makers, uh, seamstresses, singers, choreographers, uh, public relations people, um, video imaging people, um, really uh, welders, all sorts of folks who come from all over the world, all from different countries, uh, usually for about between three and five months to live and work on this ship. So quite a long time. But the nice thing is in, in exchange, we get room and board. So while people are on the ship, they have no expenses. In return, you're not making any money. So you just can't have a lot of overhead. That's the trick. Here are some more pictures from the show. They have all sorts of shows they've done. They've always been very sort of politically and progressively minded. So this show uh, was, a, it starred some monarch butterflies and it was about the environmental effects of, um, on natural ecosystems. They've done shows in the past about sort of uh, political unrest in response to the World Bank, um, sort of the Arab Spring, uh, the NSA and sort of the surveillance state. So all sorts of things. They're very, very political shows. Uh, they're not sort of my fair lady um, sing-alongs, if you will. So it's sort of more performance art, sort of avant-garde stuff. It's certainly not for everyone, but it's, it's uh, one of a kind. So you can see the way that this garbage is repurposed in the show and the way that it creates sort of really a, a bold statement for the people on shore and the way it interfaces with the communities in the background. This is in Vancouver. So this is sort of charting the, the history of the ship. Of course, uh, they predated the ship and horse and wagon sort of all around North America, but the ship was put in the water in Kingston it traveled over on a big charter ship to Europe where it moved south. It started in Northern Europe and came down through uh, to the sort of Adriatic and Aegean seas around Croatia, Greece, Italy, etc. 
Uh, then it was put back in the charter ship in 2013, brought over to the Gulf of Mexico, where it came over to Louisiana. Then it had some more fun up the Eastern seaboard, got into the Pacific, and currently now is in British Columbia. Uh, they, of course, were, they were supposed to have a show last year and continue onwards. COVID has waylaid that plan, um, but they are still going there in their mid-70s now. Uh, it, retirement is, is not really a word that's in their vocabulary. They're starting to imagine phasing themselves into a bit of a different dream. And the last they described it to me is as uh, they're going to pass this ship onto a new generation and they were going to get a smaller sailboat and sail around Greece, um, basically doing shadow puppet theater as a memoir to tell the story of their lives. Um, so, you know, ne never a dull moment with these people. They're really sort of, uh, they're artists through and through. So here's a picture of this huge ship getting lowered onto a BBC chartering vessel. This is a 30 meter Thames River spritzel barge getting tossed on the top. And it looks really small when it's on the charter ship. It's almost like a toy ship at that point. And this picture is taken, this is from 2018. 2018 and 2019, they did a huge refit of the ship, which by this point was about 30 years old, if my math holds, 20 years old, 20 so years old. Um, so this was in, just by the Fraser River in uh, just south of Vancouver in British Columbia. And they did a big refit of the ship sort of before they passed it on to the next generation. And as you can imagine, the ship had been in dry dock a few times, but not been given a full overhaul. So it was an enormous amount of work. Here's the requisite uh, cat photo just for cuteness. This cat is named Cat. It was sort of the shipyard cat that lived on the ship during the refit. But of course they had no money to do, do this. So they got new parts through donations and all of these people worked on the ship to help out through sort of a, a subsidized provincial uh, work program. So these are all just youth who wanted to be part of this exciting story and came and helped out. Of course, there are a few sort of ship experts in the mix because I think a lot of these young people mean well, but they don't quite know what they're doing, so. And it was really extensive, as I'm sure you can imagine, huge amounts of work, both outside and inside. Uh, and I only knew the ship sort of at its tail end before this, so it, it was in pretty rough shape. And to see now, it's quite stunning. So even the inside, everything was re-glossed just quite remarkable. The kitchen counters, a new stove, which would have been nice to have during my time there. And then it was taken out of its sort of barn in Shelter Island Marina with this enormous contraption. And they had a huge event. Uh, this was uh, the CBC. We sent out a photographer as well to take these pictures to support the podcast. And then this is uh, the ship refit, repainted in a promotional video that uh, they just released a few months ago for some fundraising they're doing. And so I'll leave, I'll leave you with that picture there to see it. So they are still there right now. They are hoping to launch their next production this summer. Uh, so if you are in the West Coast, I know sort of we're all over the world right now. I really encourage you to look them up. They're called Caravan Stage Company, sometimes called Caravan Stage Society. Uh, they are fascinating people. You can find that podcast on the CBC website, and they also have their own website too. Uh, the National Film Board documentary is called Horse Drawn Magic, which I really recommend. And you can find all sorts of other uh, media for them online. So before we go to questions, we have some time if you have any questions, and I will do my very best to answer them about uh, 15 minutes or so. If you have any other questions and you wanna reach out to me, this is my email. So please feel free to contact me. Um, there are lots more stories to tell about the ship, uh, about caravan. Um, and if you have any specific questions about the ship too, I can maybe connect you with some of the people who helped to build it or who know more about the inner workings of the ship, if that is where your interests lie. Okay, uh, thank you, Trevor. I'm just going to show people how they can uh, ask questions. As you look for the participants on your toolbar, uh, find uh, your way to raise hand and raise your hand and we'll ask you, uh, we'll, uh, 
would I, uh, uh, do the questions in order. A uh, quick question, where in Kingston was it built? That is a good question. And I, I don't know the name of the place, but my brother lives in Kingston. So I know the location. Uh, it's just east of the downtown. Um, so if you know, there, there's sort of a big marina right along the water, east of Princess Street. Okay, yeah, I know where it is. Yeah, okay. I know the name Perfect. of it. Uh, and uh, if, okay. you, if you don't mind, if, just give me one minute. I'm just going to run to the bathroom while you think of questions, and I'll be right back. Okay, we'll just take Thank a you. minute uh, for a second, uh, and then we'll get going. The first person in line is Ron, and as soon as Trevor's back, we'll... Uh, 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 go through the questions. And I was just asking uh, where it was in Kingston for Rob to, with the uh, consideration of the museum and how that fit in. Oh, that's a good point. Okay. Good point. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd ask everybody to remain on mute until we uh, <clears throat> uh, get to you. So the first question is Ron, go ahead and ask your question. Ron, go ahead. Is Trevor back? Yeah, he's back. Oh, okay. I couldn't see his picture. Um, yeah, Trevor. So, do you do you see yourselves as kind of inheritors of the traveling minstrel tradition, the troubadours, and that sort of thing? <clears throat> oh, I thought he was back. So, yeah, I see his. I don't see him in his view there. Yeah. So we'll just give another minute. Uh, there he is. So uh, Ron, go ahead and repeat your question. Yeah, hi Trevor. Um, so do you see yourselves in sort of the traveling minstrel tradition, the, the, the troubadours <laughs> or that sort of thing? Because they traveled obviously as performers but also with political messaging. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, I think I think they definitely started it with that idea of not only bringing entertainment, but also, you know, bringing a message, bringing sort of news along. As well, though, it's interesting knowing them the way I do now. I think theater, I think they wanted to live the way they did nomadically, and theater became something that would sort of allow them to do that. Um, certainly with, especially in the 70s and 80s, the Canadian arts grant system was much better than it is today, unfortunately. And so it was possible for them to sort of subsist uh, through grants, through theater work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next person is Liz. Uh, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, it's an extraordinary presentation, quite exciting, Trevor. Well, thank you. In the very last picture of the total refurbishing, there was a sail. So my question is, did the, did the, was the boat, did you, you sail or engine and what kind? That's an excellent question. Yes, I didn't mention that. The boat has an engine and that was used, solely used in the majority of the waterways, I would say. When they were out at sea, they would put up the sail and I, I sailed with, with the sail only a few times in my three and a half years there. Yeah. As for which kind, I won't be able to answer that. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I hear you had one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so extraordinary and, and well done. What an experience. Thank you. It was, yeah, quite remarkable. And again, there, the story is much bigger. So if it interests you, I encourage you to check out the podcast too. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jim, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. This is <clears throat> such a unique effort. It's like going to the moon uh, artistically. So my most important question is, when are you going to talk again to us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, certainly there were some of really uh, the most inspiring people I know because, not because they do everything well or they make the best decisions, but they really, constraints are just sort of a bump in the road for them. Um, which, you know, I, I, when I first joined them, I was in my late 20s, sort of early 30s, and it was, 
uh, to see people who just no obstacle was insurmountable is pretty, pretty phenomenal. I would give these, this, these people a, on a scale from zero to 10, I would give them a hundred and they are much more worthy politically to watch than Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and I hope that they would make it uh, on CNN or one of the TV networks because it's such a unique uh, artistic and political contribution. And I'm waiting for them to do the Trump era uh, shows and poli world politics about subverting war and prevent preventing war and promoting peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And yes, that's exactly in line with what they're doing. So if you do get out to the West Coast, uh, and if you know, COVID permitting, um, they plan on doing their next show this summer. Um, so they'll be in Vancouver and sort of around the uh, Squalish Sea. Uh, Diane, you're next for a question. And we have a couple of other questions after that. Okay, why don't you take the others first, Graham, and I'll, oh. I'll go last. Okay, uh, Linda, go ahead and ask your question, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, uh, hi, Trevor, uh, thank you. Just um, in terms of the audience, you, you, um, uh, presumably they s sat on the land. Did you organize that? And how did you get the sound across to them? Was, it, was there a lot of spoken words? Because you're talking to people who don't speak English in a lot of cases. How, how did you communicate? Good, very good question. So we had um, the performers were all mic'd and we would have a sound booth on the shore sort of behind the audience. The audience were encouraged to bring lawn chairs or things like that. Some people would just sit right on the grass. Um, if we happened to be in a body of water next to a public park with seating, we would utilize that for sure. As far as languages, the shows were all in multiple languages. Um, so the one song might be in, you know, Italian and English and Spanish and French. Sometimes because they could do projections, they would project subtitles in alternate languages on the, the screen. I will say that the plots are pretty out there. So even if it's in a language in which you're fluent, you may not know what's going on. I certainly sometimes did not know what was going on. It's what you could call it esoteric. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's maybe the, a euphemism for it. So, so that, that wasn't the primary concern, just getting kind of a wash of the theme, maybe it was more important. I hope they would forgive me for saying that. <laughs> okay, uh, any uh, last question uh, before I turn it over to Diane? Okay, Diane, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. I have a question about application to the sh uh, to the boat. Um, I have a grandson who lives out in Vancouver, and I know he would be interested. And also, I have uh, many theater people in my family, and uh, my son is not far off retirement, and I think he and his wife would love to be part of that. Um, he's in lighting and she's in uh, the design and, and carpentry end of it. Um, so with the application, first of all, do they take anybody who has no skills but a great deal of enthusiasm? And secondly, um, where would one find an application? These are great questions. Yes, for any of you, if you're considering maybe a uh... Uh, something exciting to do in the, the coming future. Um, you could go to their website. I know their website is being redone right now, so they might not have an application at the moment, but I'm imagining in the next few months that's going to be updated. I would say they take enthusiasm over skill. Um, and also, most importantly, Caravan, and they talk about, we talk about this in the podcast, there's a sort of caravanner type of person or personality, and that they're looking for people who have a sense of humor and are flexible because everything is always going wrong. There are no resources. The bathroom is constantly broken. The boat is full of mosquitoes. So the people who come and don't last are maybe people who cannot sort of adjust 
to what's going on. I mean, certainly they want you to apply for something you have a degree of specialty in so that you can do it. But um, I would say the heart, the thing that's harder to find that they have struggle with more is finding people who can adapt to that way of living. But as people who are no strangers to boats, I think any of you have got a fair shot. <laughs> uh, Diane, there's one last question uh, before okay. you wrap. Uh, yeah. Jim, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. I would like to see one of the TV networks pick up this group. I they think... have, they have. Oh, is that on the website? Yeah, if you check it again, the website is not uh, quite up right now, but if even if you go on YouTube and you uh, search Caravan Stage Company, the CBC produced another piece about them about 10 years ago. And there's also a really interesting piece, which I didn't have time to get to today, um, produced by the Fifth Estate, which is a CBC program. And that's because the caravan has had a lot of trouble in the past about being classified as a pleasure vessel or a commercial vessel because they sort of straddle this strange line. Um, even though they don't charge money for their shows, it's donation based. They've had a lot of trouble with Transport Canada in the past and Homeland Security in the United States, which is actually part of the reason I had to stop working for them. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of media. And during that period, they had a huge write up in the Wall Street Journal. So um, if you have some time, definitely hop on Google and and hopefully you can find what you're looking for. That sounds okay. awesome. Okay, uh, I'll turn it back to Diane for the, uh, the closing. Yes, uh, Trevor, what a what a delightful presentation and how interesting. Um, it's really interesting the story of uh, Paul and and Non and how they continue to do this and this was their life's dream really to be able to be. Uh, nomads, hippies, uh, but the I think the most amazing thing about it is how you were able to raise money all the way along and that that you did have the sponsors and that even the, the donations from the performances all added to your being able to do what, uh, what you're able to do. So thank you so much for responding to my email with a positive yes and so quickly. And I would love to talk to you about what you might else, what else you might be able to do for this group at another time. I, so, I would love to. I had such a blast and really thank you so much for reaching out to me. It was a lot of fun to go back through the story in my head and prepare this and share it with all of you today. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Let's just give him a lovely shellback round of applause. We, we applaud quietly because we can't really so, so thank you. And I look forward to hearing from you and talking to you again another time. Um, our, our speaker next week is actually me, but not me. It, uh, courtesy of Bruce Anderson, I have the video of the building of the Royal Clipper, the largest and only five-masted, fully rigged sailing ship built. Oh, and she has a complement of 42 sails. So she's quite a sight to behold. So I'll be giving you a little preamble on that. And then we will see one part of the video and we'll see the rest of it at another time uh, before the end of the year. And then on the following week, we have Wally Pegniello. She's a world traveler when she's not sorting out taxes between Canada and the US. She's a tax lawyer. And she'll tell us of one of her adventures, um, a voyage from New Zealand to the Antarctic in 31 days. Um, she is 80 years old and has had many other adventures and she probably will join us again at another time. So with that, pipes out.